Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. Mom of Grace Ministry, March 12th, 10.30 a.m. And today is the third Sunday in Lent. Uh, I'd like to begin today uh, with a couple announcements. Again, our church's goal this year is to read the Bible. The Korean school is in session, so please keep everyone in prayer. Thank you. And third, we have the Lenten Bible study going. Today we had session number three. Just very thankful that we can continue this session. Please keep us in prayer that God will show us uh, what, we, what, what God wants us to see through the book of Psalms. Number four, we're also collecting fasting offering. If you're interested, uh, the jar is available to take home in the back. If you feel called to participate, feel free. And I think that's it for the announcements. At this time, I'd like to invite everyone to stand if you're able, and let us open today's worship service with open prayer. You shake your head. <laughs> Thank you. 
standing for the time called to worship. <clears throat> worship the Lord and sing God's praises. We come into the Lord's presence with songs of thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise for the rock of our salvation. We rejoice in our time together. Drink of Christ's living water together. We thirst for God's love. Please be seated. And now let us sing. Come thou found of every blessing from the Methodist hymnal number 400. Jesus. 
Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Romans, uh, verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Yeah, I, 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 knew, I knew it was going to be Romans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I failed. <laughs> uh, I'll read on behalf of the congregation. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we are supposed in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we, we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, we'll be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more surely, having been reconciled, we would be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. for the children's quarter. Thank you for your patience. Technology is not very reliable. Unfortunately, shame on me for being so accustomed to the world. There we go. So this is time for the children's quarter and this is for uh, anyone under the age of 10. But not limited to age of 10, anyone who identifies themselves as a children of God yeah. can listen to this message and hear God's voice. <laughs> and anyone, children, if you happen to, you're, if you're watching this recording, this is for you. Um, prepared just for you. So, um, I have to think hard about how can I make what we inspire. Not very difficult but plain with simple words, and this is how I put it, okay? So friends, Jesus, do you know why he came to this world? Jesus came to this world to prepare a place for us in heaven, right? He says it himself, Jesus came to this world so that we may have a place in heaven. And he did not pay money, he did not pay dollars, to prepare a place for us in heaven. That's a good thing. <laughs> he actually paid, not with money, but he paid with his life to prepare a place for us in heaven. Now the question remains, okay, uh, Pastor, how do we go to heaven uh, to be with God? First of all, you don't have to worry right now. 
It's not happening today or tomorrow for you, at least. Um, you won't suddenly leave your family and friends and disappear into the sky. Don't worry. It will happen after a long time, a long time after you become adults. Okay? So how do we uh, go to heaven to be with God? And you may say, oh, I know. My parents paid a lot of money to buy this house. So we have to pay money to go to our house in heaven, right, Pastor? You may say that. And I'll ask you, okay, how much? <laughs> how much can you pay to go to your house in heaven that's been prepared with the life of Christ? He paid with his life to, play, to prepare a place for us in heaven. If you're trying to solve it with money, how much can you pay? A dollar? Ten dollars? Hundred dollars? Thousand dollars? Hundred thousand dollars? A million dollars? You can go up. Unfortunately, my friends, no matter how much we pay, we cannot go to heaven to be with God by paying money. Because Jesus paid with his life to prepare a place for us in heaven. And we cannot calculate the cost of his life with numbers, right? Makes no sense. We can't buy someone's life with money. Jesus paid with his life to buy us to prepare for us a place in heaven. How can we pay that with money, right? That doesn't make sense. God does, however, ask us for one thing. God wants us to put our trust in Jesus and say, God, what Jesus did for me on the cross is enough. That's enough for me to go to heaven to be with you. That's the only thing God requires from us. So. In recap, Jesus came to prepare a place for us in heaven. And how do you go to heaven? We put our trust in Jesus Christ and say to God, Jesus is enough. Then we'll not only be able to go to heaven to be with God, we're going to begin to see changes happening right now because we will become thankful and happy people of Jesus if we put our trust in Jesus Christ. Starting today. So friends, let us put our trust in Jesus for our time here and our time in heaven. And that's the message of the Romans I wanted to share with you this morning. I'm sorry if it was difficult, but you get it. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you this morning <clears throat> that we can come together to meditate on the Romans chapter 5 and, and to share your grace in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for coming to this world to die for us and to rise again on the third day to give us life. Lord, we receive this gift with faith and only by faith because we cannot do anything to earn what you accomplished on the cross. We receive this free gift with gratitude and thankfulness. And Lord, as we receive this gift, Transform our hearts and our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. time to eat when you're hungry <laughs> that's the right time when is the right time to study when is the right time to study yeah I thought you were going to say every day <laughs> every moment 
<laughs> thank you, thank you for that. That's actually a very good answer. I was going to say, when well, is the right time to study? Is it the age 43? Amen. Amen. <laughs> when, is the, Carol, when is the right time to do homework? That's due tomorrow. <laughs> so try it. There's the right answer. When is the right time to do homework? That's due tomorrow. <laughs> it's pretty good because I was going to say tomorrow during lunchtime. <laughs> right before stew. <laughs> Play with the clock on canvas. Time is running out. Sometimes the right times are clear, very clear. Um, when is the right time to read the Bible? Today. <laughs> and when is the right time to pray? Right now. The right times are clear, and there are right times for everything. But unfortunately, there are other times when the right times are not so clear. I just talked to you about when's the right time to do stuff, and, and I said, oh, there are right times that are clear. We clearly know when the right time is. But then there are also times when we're not so sure, when things are very unclear about when the right time is. For example, if Nathan asks me, first of all, when should I start compiling my college list? And I'll probably say, uh, probably sometime soon, like early in the summer, I don't know, <laughs> unclear. <laughs> the right time to put the college list together is unclear. If I ask, um, if I ask one, of the, one of the adults here, um, my car says I have 90 miles left to drive. Should I get gas at Wawa down the road today? Is that the right time to get gas? And someone might, might say, yeah, maybe, yeah, just go get the gas today. Uh, other people may say, just wait and go to Costco tomorrow and save some money on the gas, right? They're not so, I mean, like, right time to get gas, right time to, you know, put the list together, sometimes not so clear. Uh, sometimes they're very clear, like, when you eat, when you're hungry, when you start studying, like, the night before, sometimes not so clear. Sometimes right times are in our control, right? We decide when the right time is. But there are other times when they are out of control. And some of us may be waiting, still waiting for the right time to come. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know everything that's going on, but you may, you may still be waiting. You may be praying God, praying to God every day. God, when is the right time? And you may still be waiting for the right time to come. So they are in our control sometimes. And the right times are not always in our control. We can't do anything about it. It was my first year in college, uh, a couple decades ago. It was my first year in college, so I had a very difficult time adjusting to music school. Our accompanist, Panju Janami, she went to music school, so she kind of understands the vibe. But I had a difficult time adjusting to music school because it was very different from going, going it was very different from going to a normal high school. I went to local high school, and all of a sudden, I was placed in a music school, and everything was different. There was no chemistry, no physics, no math, only music, and only history and arts. And I had a very difficult time adjusting to music school. And I didn't know what I was doing, to be honest, especially in the beginning. Uh, I was in music school, and classes, classes were difficult, and they were awkward, because music, to me, was still kind of new because I became a musician pretty late, uh, late in high school. And I lacked the background knowledge and the experience necessary to be successful in music school. Because I went to music school after only, I don't know if I shared with you, but I only six months of formal training, I auditioned, and then, and then I got in. And of course I struggled, because I didn't perform any recitals, no experience, no knowledge about history very little about theory, so I was struggling in the beginning. I, I didn't like it. I didn't like music school in the beginning. And I also commuted while most students live in the dorm. Like, Caleb here, you live in the dorm. But I commuted 30 minutes every single day. And I learned that those who lived in the dorm, they became friends very quickly. We had a very small class body, about 90. 90 per class, like 90 per, per grade. Not great, 90 per year. And they all became friends very quickly because they, the majority of them live in the dorm. 
and I was one of the few who actually commuted. And I didn't even run into my colleagues outside of class because they all went back to the dorm. And I spent much time by myself uh, in the practice room because I didn't know where to go. I didn't know any friends. I just went to the practice room to practice. And it was really difficult. Like I didn't have friends. I didn't know people. School was difficult. It was kind of boring. And I didn't know what I was doing in school. So even after achieving the dream of getting into music school, I felt lost uh, for many months beginning. And I thought about transferring out at some point, but I, but I stayed. Because the music school was very different from what I expected in a negative way. And I felt like I had lost the meaning of life. I was directionless. And I quickly lost interest in not only in music, but in a lot of the things I was doing. Because I was unhappy as a freshman in college, in music school. Everything was so foreign, so different. And even on the weekends, I did go to church. But I thought to myself, why am I doing in church? I'm miserable on the weekdays. And why am I doing here? Maybe I should be practicing. And then one day, I found the meaning, the true meaning and purpose of my life. Before then, getting into music school was the meaning and purpose of my life. That was the only thing I cared about. Uh, let me get in, let me get in. I want to go to music school. That was the meaning and purpose of my life. And that was when I heard, actually, the gospel for the first time. Someone came up to me to share the gospel. I was lost, I was directionless, I was tired, and someone came up to me. Uh, of course, I used to follow my friends to church, and I sat through numerous sermons. I played guitar and drums to the praise team, and I participated in many activities. And I shared with you already a couple of weeks ago that from the 30-hour famine story, yeah, I was, I was active in church. Um, I participated in the 30-hour famines, the lock-ins, the retreats. And, but that was the first time that day, my low point when I was lost, when I was tired, when I was directionless. That day when someone came up to me to share the gospel, that was the first time I heard a gospel message for the first time. First time I had someone come up to me to share the message, like Peter, proclaiming the gospel message to the crowd in the book of Acts. I honestly didn't understand everything that was spoken to me, but it was the beginning of a slow, but guided and accompanied change. So I know I shared with you a lot of stuff. Basically what happened was, I was very lost. I was not happy. In the beginning of my college years. And then one day, when I thought I was at my low point, someone came up to me to share the gospel message that initiated the beginning of change. And there was the beginning of me finding true meaning and purpose of life other than my accomplishments and what's shown on the outside. And when the gospel was shared to me, I honestly didn't understand everything that was spoken to me. But like I said, it was the beginning of not a solo change, but it was the beginning of a guided and accompanied change. Like I said before, I put meaning and purpose in things and achievements. But that was the day I began to put my trust in God and learn to walk with God. I can't say I'm a complete I'm not complete yet, as you can see. <laughs> I'm a work in progress. But my 18th birthday, my low point, I wanted to quit school, <laughs> I hated music. My low point happened to be the beginning of my transformation and beginning of me walk, learning to walk with God. How strange is that? Is that coincidence? Looking back, my low point, I do not wish to go back. But looking back, maybe this is more for our younger students who are younger than me here. Because um, I probably went through, not all of the things you're going through. Uh, you're living a more, more difficult life. I, was, I, I lived a pretty, pretty relaxed life. <laughs> you guys are much more, uh, much more, it's much more, you guys are busy. But looking back, that low point when God reached out to me, Maybe that was the right time. That was the right time for God to do God's work and touch my heart. Strange, if you think about it, strange. 
God, why? Why go for me? Why don't you find me when I, when I get accepted? <laughs> when I'm successful, why don't you come to me then? Why do you come to me at my low point? God came to me at my low point on my 18th birthday. That was the beginning of change, beginning of transformation. And looking back, that was the right time. Right time for God to come to me. Perhaps it is true. The end of me is the beginning of God. Perhaps it's true. The end of me, 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 is the beginning of God. Me and God can coexist. I have to go for God to begin. Perhaps God waited for me to go so that God can come in. The end of me, maybe, is really the beginning of God. When all of my options run out, that's when we realize God is the only option. Think about this for a minute. How many options do you have in your life? Unfortunately for me, I don't have any options. And I'm on the verge of running out every month. <laughs> How many options do you have? You probably have a lot more options than I do. But every month I'm beginning to realize When all of my options run out, that's when I realize God is the only option. So I want to I I bless you. I want to encourage you this morning. If you think you're running out on options, um, that's okay. Because um, when we run out of the options, I think that's when we realize, wow, God is the only option. And I still survive and I'm still here. Uh, there were times when all my options run, ran out. <laughs> and then this God just provided, you know, that one option that worked for me. So, um, if I'm alive, then I'm the living testimony that <laughs> even if your options run out, you're not going to die. <laughs> God's going to give you the best option. Um, we think we decide the right time, but in reality, God decides the right time. We talked about the right times in the beginning, right? When is the right time? Do we decide? Who decides? Like, is it clear or unclear? Ultimately, ultimately, um, other than little things, ultimately, in the big picture, we think we decide the right time, but it's ultimately God decides the right time. I didn't decide <laughs> what time, the right time to hear the gospel. God decided, and it was my low point, which was a perfect time for God to work. When was the right time for Jesus to come to the world? To us. When was the right time for Jesus Christ to come to this world for us? Was it when the world was successful, impressive? When Apple began to make MacBooks and iPhones? <laughs> no, it was way before. The Bible says, Paul says, Christ came at the right time. And what time was that? Paul says, Christ came to us just at the right time. And that was when we were hopeless. And while we were still sinners, but we didn't realize we were sinners. At the low, 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 low point, that's when Christ came to this world. Like how Christ came to me at my low, low, low point when I was miserable freshman in college. When we were hopeless, while we were still sinners, that was the right time for Jesus to come to us at our lowest point. After many generations of silence from God, after the last prophet of the Old Testament, hundreds of years of gap, generations of silence, when people were hopeless, when they forgot who God was, when they didn't even realize they needed God. That's when Jesus came to save us 2,000 years ago. There's a 400 year gap between the last time God sent the prophet to speak. Of course, people rejected. God was silent for 400 years. And what then no one expected at the lowest, lowest point where people were miserable. When they failed to acknowledge, acknowledge their need for God, that's when Christ came to this world. Christ came and died for us when we were hopeless, while we were still sinners. And this changed everything. This changed everything. 
Because of Jesus, by faith, the Bible says we are made right with God. And because we are made right with God, because we are made right with God, we have peace with God. What does that mean? Before Jesus Christ, what got in the way between God and us? Sin. Before Jesus, sin got in the way between God and us. And sin is just, it, it's, it's more. It's more than just being bad. <laughs> sin, is, sin is bigger. It's more than that. Um, the bad that we see in the world, they're the consequences of sin. Um, the sin with the, with the lowercase s. But then I'm talking about the uppercase s, sin. Before Jesus Christ, sin got in the way between God and us. But Jesus took care of the problem of sin through his death and resurrection, right? We heard about this. And because of Jesus right now, nothing gets in the way between God and us because God, because Jesus removed the stumbling block between God and us, which was sin. He took care of the problem on the cross by dying on the cross and rising on the third day. So nothing gets in the way between God and us. In that sense, because of Jesus, because the obstacle is removed, because the stumbling block is removed, we are made right with God because of Jesus Christ. What's the consequence of that? Peace with God. And by putting our trust in Jesus Christ, we say to God, God, I believe that I am made right with you because of Jesus Christ. And now we have peace. Nothing stands in the way. And I'm so happy they were friends again, God. Paul says, because we are made right with God, as a consequence, we have peace with God. There's more. We have access into something called grace. What's grace? Grace is our favorite language as Methodists. <laughs> more than that. Grace means undeserved privilege. Something we do not deserve, that's grace. Because, of, because Jesus made us right with God, we didn't do anything, but we have peace with God. And because we have peace with God, we have access to this undeserved privilege, this grace of being called God's children, God's friends. What did we do? Nothing. We didn't do anything to earn it. But because of Christ, we are made right with God. We have peace with God. And not only that, we have this undeserved privilege of being called God's children and God's friends. How amazing is that? Undeserved privilege because we didn't do anything to earn it. And as God's children, we belong to God's family. And this is the, this is the climax. Because we are God's children, we can look forward to sharing God's glory. That escalated very quickly because we went from people with no association with God because of sin to children to people who will share God's glory. Who are we? We went from here to here. Who did it? Jesus did it. And only Jesus could do it. Because of Jesus, we are made right with God, called children of God, and we're going to share the glory, God's glory. Think of it this way. If the parents, if the parents buy a big house, right? Who has a big house here? I'll visit you. <laughs> if the parents buy a big house with eight rooms, each child gets a spacious room in the house, right? Big, if the parents buy a big house with eight rooms, each child gets a big room and they get to enjoy everything in the house. Parents are not gonna say, get up, I bought this house. They're not gonna say that to the children. As children, each children has his or her own room. They enjoy everything in the house even though they did not make any financial contributions. What's the only reason? They're children. In the same way, 
What's the only reason for us to look forward to sharing God's glory? What did we do? Did we make any contributions? Nothing. It's not because each one of us deserves a fair share of God's glory, no. It's because we belong to God's family. That's the only reason. God's saying to us, my child, my child, you belong to my family, and I'm not going to say, this is mine. You get nothing. I'm not going to say that God's saying, my child, my child, everything I have is yours. Because you belong to me. In that sense, you can look forward to sharing God's glory. Of course, I, I, do not, I do not have time to share everything about how amazing this is. But that's what Jesus did for us. And we say, oh, Jesus died for me, rose again on the third day. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. What does it mean? That means going from being enemies to being the children of God. That's what it means. And that's what Jesus did. That's what God did through Jesus Christ. Scooped us out. Cleaned us. And now God is calling every one of us. You're precious. You're important. You're my child. Because of my son, Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the glimpse of what salvation is. Right? It's crazy. We went from sinners to children of God who look forward to sharing God's glory. That's amazing. That's a good deal. <laughs> Thank you, God. When, when, when this becomes real in our lives, in other words, when everything that I just talked about regarding who we are, what Jesus did for us, going from alienated to children, basically when peace with God, everything that I talked about, when this becomes real in our lives, not just knowing, agreeing with the hand, if the truth, if the gospel, if it becomes real in our lives, Paul says, he changes everything. And one of the biggest changes they experience if we, if God becomes real, if Christ becomes real, is it changes our view on suffering. Problems and trials in life. Because without Jesus Christ, Sufferings make our lives miserable. Like we, we don't want them. And they make us curse everything around us. Like, why do you exist and make things more difficult for me? Out of my life, please. Problems, trials, suffering. What are you doing here? But with Jesus being real in our lives, it's a little scary. But Paul says we can rejoice in our sufferings. How, can anybody rejoice in the suffering? Can, can somebody relate to this? Can you rejoice in the suffering? It's, it's difficult. It's difficult. But when Christ becomes real in life, it changes us so much that we can rejoice in our sufferings because we know through the Spirit, trials and problems help us develop character, endurance, I'm sorry. The sufferings help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And the strength of character strengthens our confident hope of our salvation. Basically, with Jesus, we can rejoice in our sufferings. Not because they hurt us. But with Jesus, we can rejoice in our sufferings because sufferings make us more confident. They make us more hopeful people of Christ. And we're confident because we know how much God loves us. That's why we're confident. Even though sufferings are difficult, we rejoice in the sufferings, and it only strengthens our confidence. It makes us more hopeful people because we know that God loves us. God is not doing this because God hates us. But because God loves us, we're confident. Regardless of where we are in life, sufferings come, trials come, problems come. We're still confident because we know how much God loves us. And how do we know God loves us? 
Paul says, we know how much God loves us because God's love is in our hearts. The Holy Spirit fills our hearts with God's love. In other words, the more we are filled with God's love through the Holy Spirit, the more we know how much God loves us. The closer we are to God, the more we know we are loved. However, the farther we are away from God, the less we know we're loved. Right now, if you feel, if you think, oh, I don't think God loves me. I just don't feel loved by God. Ask yourself this question, am I far from God or am I close to God? Because the Holy Spirit fills us with God's love, and that's how we know we're loved by God. The equation is simple. The closer you are to God, the more you know that you're loved. The farther away from God, the less you know that you're loved by God. So if, you're, if you know you're dearly loved by God, and you, you, you just experience it, you just, you just enjoy it every day, uh, then, then you're, you're close to God. But then if you, if you think, oh, I don't know, God doesn't love me, life is difficult, Sufferings, I, I hate sufferings. <laughs> and then, then, then ask yourself, like, where am I with God? Before Jesus, I'm almost done, I'm sorry. Before Jesus, problems and trials existed to make our lives more miserable. But because of Jesus, problems and trials strengthen our hope of salvation. And this is a big change. And this is what peace with God looks like when it becomes real in our lives. And I'm going to close, close with this question. How can peace with God become real in our lives? Maybe I should have asked this in the beginning. <laughs> but how can peace with God become real in our lives? How do you know that in your life, where you are, how do you know that the peace of God is real? Carol, how do you know? How do, oh no, it's okay, sorry. It's just early in the morning. I think I, I got a, a, a possibility. Yes. Maybe a journey. A journey. Journey. That's true. That's true too. You're on, the, on the path. Yes, yes, yes. You check to see where you're journeying and you see where you're where you are in the, in the path on the path, right? Excellent. I want to share one more in line with what Mr. Dave is saying. How can peace with God become real in our lives? We have to go to a quiet place. We have to close the door, close our eyes, and examine deep in our hearts. And we got to uncover one layer at a time. Go to a quiet place, close your eyes, close the door, and examine your heart. Unfortunately, our heart is covered with many, many layers. We have to uncover one layer at a time, protection after protection, lie after lie. Did you know that we can cover our hearts with lies? Did you know that? I can cover my heart with my own lie, and I can, make it, I can make it look nice. But to see if peace with God is real, we've got to go through the process of uncovering every layer of protection that we put on, every layer of lie that we wrapped around, until we get to the bottom and we see who is really in the driver's seat. Because we can cover it up nicely and we can tell ourselves, yeah, the driver's God, the driver's God, cover it up. But if you uncover one layer at a time, lie after lie, protection after protection, and see really deep inside who is driving, if you're driving, then unfortunately the peace with God is going to be very difficult to be real. It has to be God who drives the vehicle for us to 
experience the peace of peace with God, which is real. And for us to go through this amazing transformation of rejoicing in the sufferings, don't we all want to rejoice in the sufferings? I do. And that's all I wanted to share this morning. Thank you for listening. I, if I go on, I might, I might continue for too long. <laughs> But please, uh, please uh, just remember a couple things. That when, he, when Christ came to us, He was at our low point. When we were hopeless, while we were still sinners. And because of Jesus Christ, we're made with God, we have peace with God. And we went from being sinners to the children of God. And this, if this becomes real, then it's going to transform everything in our minds. And the biggest transformation Paul says is going to be how to see the suffering. And how we process, and how we how we understand, and how we live through the sufferings. It's not going to be just miserable, miserable, miserable. But when peace with God is real through sufferings, we are only going to be more confident people in the hope of our salvation. Was that too confusing? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning. Just just going deep with Romans. Um, thank you so much, Lord. For us to thank you for allowing us to see wow what, what it means what it means uh, what Christ did uh, not not just not just superficially but going just just a little bit of, a little bit in depth of what it, what it means what it means to be saved we thank you for giving us the eyes to see and the ears to hear and Lord we also ask us to ask you to give us the mouth mouth to speak this truth proclaim this truth. So that those who need to hear at their low points may hear the gospel message and experience God finding them where they are and God calling them the children of God. We thank you for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And now it's time for the it's time for the presentation of the offering. Praise saving message of Christ and to help our neighbors in need. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now let us sing the closing hymn. Breathe on me, breath of God, from the Methodist hymn of Word Form.
last time. Lord, uh, we, we thank you so much um, for reminding us through the book of Romans, chapter 5. Important truth, important things about the gospel. Um, that what, what Christ came to do in our Lord's own role is, is beyond our understanding. It's beyond our words. And Lord, the more we get into it, the more amazed we are. Because we'll probably be able to just never get to the bottom of your love for us. And thank you for reminding us this morning how much you love for us. And how you want us to be loved. And Lord, we confess so many times um, we want love. But at the same time, we don't want to be loved by you. We reject your love. I'm sorry, Lord. Maybe we're afraid. We're afraid to change. Uh, we're afraid to be different. But Lord, give us the heart to accept your love in Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us that we may accept you, that we make the decision to be loved by you. And Lord, may that be the beginning of transformation. We ask you to bless every one of us here.